YouTube, what is good? It is your boy Flex. And put your muscles up. Because we're back with another video. In this video, man, we're going to be checking out a man who built a world beating race bike in his garage. I thought this one would be an interesting one for all my motorcycle enthusiasts, man. So let's go ahead and cut out all the chit chat. Grab your headphones, turn the volume up, get that full experience. Get to the videos watching. Let's go. I think many motorcycle mechanics and engineers and designers and even riders have had this thought before. It's almost an invasive thought. It's so silly. But the question that pops into their mind is, what if I built my own motorcycle? I'm not talking about taking a motorcycle and customizing it to your liking or even fabricating a few pieces, though that does take quite a bit of skill and precision. No, I'm not even talking about what Alan Milliard does in his sheer genius engineering things like a Dodge Viper engine into a motorcycle or cutting up a Kawasaki Z1 engine and turning it into an inline six. No, this is even a step beyond that. I'm talking about building a motorcycle from the ground up, frame, engine, basically everything. Well, one person did that, and he didn't just build a motorcycle. He built a race bike that would go on to win international races and set land speed records that still to this day are held. Here's the story of how one New Zealander named John Britton, against virtually all odds, built one of the greatest motorcycles of all time. John and I ain't gonna lie, man, that thing is slick. That thing is very slick for a person who just built that thing in his garage, man. The design is so nice. Britton grew up around motorcycles and just around mechanical stuff. And he was one of those kids who really took to machinery at a really young age. At the age of six, John built a fully working pedal go-kart made wow. primarily of Apple boxes. Wow. And at the age of seven, John's dad gave him an engine kit. And John took a few months to build it, but he ended up building this really detailed, intricate engine. Now, this is really where it all started for him, as it often does with young kids. Many of you probably grew up tearing into lawnmowers or just anything with an engine, and that may have started your love for mechanical things. At 11, John saved up enough money to make his go-kart well go with a gas-powered engine his older sister recalls his obsession with projects like this he wanted to push everything he built to the absolute limit it wasn't just machines he did other crazy things like john dug a labyrinth of tunnels from his house to his neighbor's property john and his sisters would build lemonade stands and they even built a little fair that people would pay to attend john learned a lot not only from his father but also from his grandfather who built his own house wow. something that john would end up doing himself now, aside from nice. giving his Holy entire biography, heck. which you can read about in this awesome book called Dare to Dream, The John Britton Story, just know this. John Britton, growing up, was fearless and tenacious. That's the sense I get that he was this way his entire life. Now, in terms of motorcycles, John actually started restoring his first motorcycle at the age of 13, namely an old Indian scout. And he would go on to fix and restore multiple vintage cars. And at 26, he took on a 1946 Triumph Tiger 100 that he found lying around, and he would race this bike in vintage racing for quite a while. And even when riding vintage motorcycles and vintage cars, John would- I should go for a run today, but it looks like it could rain. Save on epic rain jackets at Sierra find himself pushing these vehicles to the absolute limit and often crashing them and breaking bones. But his first sort of bespoke motorcycle design was known as the Aero D0. And let's let's take a look at that for a second. Let's take a look at that design. That is actually a quite intriguing design. Like this, like this, the front end design, I feel like would would make for a really aerodynamic bike, man. This is a very neat design. I like it. I like it. His first sort of bespoke motorcycle design was known as the Aero D0 and the Aero D1. The Aero D0 was built on a bevel drive Ducati engine and trellis frame, whereas the Aero D1 utilized a Kevlar carbon fiber composite. Now this matters for later on in the bikes that he would build. It also had a monocoque frame with a semi-stressed engine. The swing arm was fabricated aluminum and was mounted directly to the gearbox assembly. And John actually crashed this second bike. At that point, he was actually going to walk away from the project altogether but he ended up shortly after just making a few adjustments so that the crash that happened to him wouldn't happen to anybody else now these aero bikes these first bikes had some racing successes in local races and speed runs and the whole goal of these platforms was aerodynamics and really right. experimenting with advanced methods for sort of streamlining the motorcycle now the next step was to build an engine well at least that was the next step for john <laughs> might not be the next step if you were in his situation or if i was but for him that's what he felt he had to do and as we often know from motorcycle manufacturing in history among 
major companies taking on the risk of building your own engine. It's another level of complication. You're really sort of reinventing the wheel and the notion that you can do it better than the big companies that have been developing for decades and decades and even upwards of 100 years. Well, it's a bit ambitious. Philip right. Vincent's journey to building his own single and then V-twin is actually very similar to John's. And the pursuit of speed is really at the heart of everything for this kind of person. Many of you brought up John in my video on Philip Vincent, and I do actually think that this is a really good comparison, these two. Now this pursuit, the pursuit of a custom hand-built engine built for racing, would really consume John pretty much for the rest of his life. This is the beginning of the motorcycle that would be known as the Briton. This first, basically fully hand-built race bike would own John's iconic signature that would remain on his bikes going forward. It actually all started for John the signature when John's friend Bob Denson of Denko Engineering, these were the guys who had built a motor for his previous Aero D1. Anyways, Bob found one of John's signatures and he basically touched it up a bit, made it look a little bit nicer, and then blew it up, and that signature would end up being featured on the Briton 1000. Now this first bike would feature a first fully carbon fiber body. Now I should say at this point that there are loads of different characters in his story and I can't feature all of them. It wasn't as though John just like drew up his own engine and motorcycle design and just started pouring molds. John had many volunteers and paid sort of co-conspirators with him, people who labored and labored long hours on this project. It really was a passion project, not just for John, but for a lot of people. And we could say that the real genius of John Britton's work was more than just his engineering prowess, though that was obviously incredible. He was really able to motivate and excite people about the project. They really believed in him, and as we'll see, it was for good reason. Now this first bike that was really a complete hand-built bike was a liquid-cooled sort of custom V-twin engine. It was made almost entirely from scratch. Now the first Britain V1000 was completed just months before Daytona in March of 1989. Think about this, this guy was making a liquid-cooled race bike with a V-twin platform for racing. And I'm not the first to say this, but Harley should have brought this guy on and just like funded him to create the ultimate American racing machine. You know, that's kind of beside the point, but this bike, it, it should valid, have been a hard Very valid. You know, I feel 100%. like the Briton was a lot better than the Buell. Just saying. Anyways, if you're curious how a bike like this could be raced at Daytona, there's a clause that allows for individually built bikes in the Pro Twins category, which would later be called the Battle of the Twins. And that was how John was able to do this. Now, when Daytona rolled around, the bike really wasn't ready. It actually needed a muffler. Somehow the muffler was missed in all this. And just before the race, John's mechanic, Alan, bought a tin of of canned beans. He poured the beans out. I'm assuming he ate them, but you never know. Then he poked holes in the bottom of the can, and they attached it, and voila, they had a muffler. And out hey, you of pity, do what you they do, were allowed man. to race. <laughs> That's awesome. So the bike had problems that were worked out after qualifying, but there was no place to test the bike in the morning before the race, so they took it out to a remote beach road, and his mechanic, Alan, recalls John firing up this hand-built, loud V-twin race machine and just tearing it around corners. And just he just remembers it as this crazy moment. So the race started that morning, and Gary Goodfellow took off on board ahead of everyone, only to have the bike die at the first corner. The race yeah, that's that's pretty nutty, man. I ain't gonna lie, to, to only be able to test the bike one time and then go race with it, that's... That's some courage right there. I don't know if it's courage or idiocy, but either way. This was over, but this weird green crazy. homemade machine had sort of started a legend. People were curious. So going back to the drawing board, John brought on more capable team members along the way, and Daytona of 1990 rolled around, and John actually showed up with two Britons now. The bikes roared around the racetrack. People were in awe at these machines, and they managed fifth and eighth place. And the Briton was winning races in America and Canada, breaking lap records. At this time, John brought the bike back, though, to New Zealand, and he turned the thing basically into a two-wheeled New Zealand flag yeah, with his iconic crazy. signature on it. Now, that this was dope. the first time in 50 years of racing at Daytona that anyone had really experienced any sort of success with a hand-built motorcycle. We think of it as being long gone now. It, it's been long gone for a long time. But John wasn't satisfied. He knew, having seen the bike finish just behind the factory Ducati in second at the Battle of the Twins, wow. he knew he could make the bike better. But a lot needed to be done at this point, and mainly the bike needed to be made more aerodynamic. He knew that making the same kind of bike as the factory teams just wasn't going to work. They had to do something completely different, and at this point, the bike wasn't different enough to really stand out and really beat those factory bikes. John came back a bit depressed about it all because he sort of 
I can remember him coming back and saying that there's no way that we can beat, you know, our work Staccati by building the same sort of bike as them. Because you're always going to be second fiddle. You're never going to have the equipment and the sport and the backup. So you've got to do something quite radical. His team continued to grow, and interestingly enough, John's passion for vintage motorcycles and understanding how the history of race motorcycles really worked, that would lead him to build the next iteration. And one of the more interesting aspects of this new design was the cutaway bodywork. They removed all of the bodywork from the fairing, basically, like the bodywork that was below the fairing. And the reason was simple. They'd tested the incomplete bike, the one with out the full fairing versus the one with the full fairing and the one without it was faster. Cycle World describes this bike that That's they so started to build as a torpedo style. atop a knife blade. So the narrow engine and tires creates the knife underneath the rider enclosed in the flowing body, which is the torpedo. Then you have the spaghetti-like exhaust, and that was actually purposeful. This wasn't just some like avant-garde design. It was all tucked away to create more airflow. Plus, there were four valve ports where the exhaust came out, so they all had to be lengthened individually to reach the same endpoint specifically while not having them like jut out of the bike itself to create it more aerodynamic. So they're all like wrapped and weaved around That's behind cool. the engine to make it so that the bike stayed aerodynamic. Wow. It's pretty genius. Yeah. The radiator the, was the, moved the to behind the that. engine, which meant that they could put the rear shock where the radiator would normally be. This was incredibly innovative and that just really scratches the surface. Like John's machines did suspension in a completely different way he wasn't working within a system of you know just using upside down forks like all the other manufacturers were even the extensive use of carbon fiber at this point this really wasn't a thing you got to think this is like the late 80s early 90s at that time race bikes weren't really using carbon fiber and he really saw this as the future to be able to build light durable material for creating fast light motorcycles the only problem was little was known about working with this material of carbon fiber and because of this their work in building all these pieces was actually quite toxic and actually affected some of the people's health now they were building a piece of art at this point without even knowing it i've talked about this in my videos on iconic and beautiful motorcycles throughout history sometimes function can lead to form. So this bike may not look pretty in a conventional sense, but the more you understand what they're doing beautiful. and why, it sort of becomes beautiful. One uh, rider called this a sculpture capable of things. 300 kilometers per hour, or the fastest work of art I'm ever going to see. It would ultimately be featured in the Art of the Motorcycle exhibit or the Guggenheim Museum. It was a beautiful monster, if you will. But this entrepreneur brand logo was done by a top freelancer on Fiverr. Is simple. But could it race? What have we got? I think three weeks to the day that this bike has to leave for Daytona, and we still haven't even tried the new engine, let alone built the bike. Well, the first attempt with this new bike, this completely redesigned bike, really wasn't pretty. They took the bike out on the track, and at a relatively low speed, the front end of the bike completely shattered, causing the rider to crash. Ooh. Now, this was just eight weeks before Daytona. John was absolutely devastated that he put this rider on his machine and watched him just crash and break his collarbone, all because the bike just couldn't handle it for some reason. So they jumped back in. I mean, he was thinking about quitting, but they jumped back in, fixed the front end. They never wow. had problems like that again after that. Now, this was the year 1992, and the night before the race, the crew was up all night working on the engine after the bike had overheated during qualifying and had actually caused there to be a crack in the cylinder sleeve. No, no, not a Ducati. It's a Britain, it's a Britain motor, correct? I mean, he machined the block. He designed everything, is my understanding. The next morning, the bike found itself starting off the line in 12th place, but the incredible power and lightweight meant that it would absolutely tear through the field right from the get-go. Soon it was leading the pack, but the race was called due to rain. They restarted. The Briton was, you know, restarting in the front, but the bike died from a loose uh -huh. wire, causing the battery uh -huh. to be flat. The bike was also incredibly and now infamously wheelie prone. This bike caught the attention of the press, even though they didn't win. Everybody wanted to know more about this pink and blue thing flying around the track. Now, that was just the first nice. round of the Battle of the Twins. That's Round nice. two was at Laguna Seca just three months later, and the Briton would take second there in spite of qualifying at the back of the pack. 
And the final stop for the Battle of the Twins was at Assen in Europe, where the Briton finally won, but just by 0.2 seconds. So it had proven itself internationally with a second and first place at Laguna and Assen, but the bike would go on to win multiple races locally in New Zealand and Australia. I say locally. That's still national, you know, it's still incredible, but just not what we often think of for racing here in the States or in Europe. But the bike, again, it would continue in the next few years to be raced all over the world and win lots of races. And the platform would set multiple records, including the World Flying Mile, set in 93, alongside the World Standing Start Quarter Mile Top Speed, World Standing Start Kilometer, and the World Flying Mile record was 302.708 kph in 1993, which I believe it still holds, which is pretty amazing. In 94, the Briton won the Daytona race, finally clocking 304 kph, which was 16 kph faster than the works Kawasaki. Now that same year, John decided to finally take the bike to the Isle of Man, and three bikes were brought, raced by Nick Jeffries, Robert Holden, and Mark Farmer, and Farmer tragically crashed his Briton and was killed at Glen Helen. The bike wasn't at fault, they did an investigation into this, but this was really devastating for John. With 19 years of racing the Isle of Man, I mean, it's not the first time it has happened to me that, in that I've lost a close friend. Um, I've never lost a teammate before. It was particularly tough in this instance uh, with the, the Britain team and Roberto Capaldi. Realistically hearing force for the first time, I think it, it was very, very t- difficult for them. But the bike was incredibly successful in twins racing in the following years, taking first in almost every single race of the BEARS or Bears World Championship. And just weeks before John's death, he learned that his bike had actually won the Bears World Championship, which was a huge deal. Now, just a month after his 45th birthday, John died from inoperable skin cancer on September 5th, 1995, again at the age, the incredibly young age of 45. It's amazing to think about what this guy accomplished in such a short time. The Britain bike is certainly his greatest achievement, but this guy did a lot more than that. You know, for one example, he built his own house. He built this unbelievable house that was originally horse stables, and he turned it to this, like, incredible thing that's still, like, being used by people. There are currently 10 production Britons in the world. These are some of the most valuable motorcycles in the entire world, some of which are available to see. If you're in the States, Britain number seven is on display at the Barber Vintage Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham, Alabama, but the Britain had its detractors in its day. The idea that anyone but an established factory could just build a race bike, like that was just completely unheard of even 30 years ago. Now, I asked this question in my video on Philip Vincent and the Vincent Motorcycle Company. Could someone like Philip Vincent or John Britton make a motorcycle like this today? Could they do what was done then now? Could someone bring on a small team of dedicated, brilliant people and build a world-beating motorcycle in their garage? See, the same principles that were at play then still apply today. The same things that John Britton knew, they're still there today. Every major manufacturer on some level is still working within a system. Many of them are stuck and they can't get out of it. You know, many of John's innovations, like the rear-mounted radiator, for example, these are standard things in many race bikes today, but few have taken a chance, for example, on his front suspension setup. And I think this is because brands, they have a certain look and feel that they have to follow or a certain platform that they have to follow. Mm -hmm. Ducati and Harley, for example, they can only make V or L-shaped engines. Suzuki isn't going to make anything but an inline four for racing. There's just some things these companies can't do. Look at the Ducati 999, for example, and how much it pissed everyone off that Ducati would make a motorcycle that just didn't look like a Ducati. I mean, it didn't have a single-sided swing arm, so it must be horrible, right? This is the advantage that startups today have, and this is what John Britton saw. He knew that the companies just couldn't do certain things and he could do those things. So he may not have the team and the millions and millions of dollars behind him, but he knew he could try stuff that was different and he could start clean and he could take bigger risks. And more importantly, he could look forward and really innovate and not be worried about what everybody thought. And because of this, the Briton today still doesn't look old. It still looks new. Like it could easily pass for a modern sport bike. I mean, even now you've got bikes like the Speed Triple RR and other bikes that, yeah, they look like certain old bikes, but they also look a lot like the Briton with their cutaway fairing. And really, that's what makes a legendary motorcycle. I think so the nice. Black Superior SS100 or the Vincent's Black Shadow or Black Lightning, the current 300 horsepower Kawasaki Ninja H2R or the Ducati Superleggera, these are motorcycles 
that are decades ahead of their time. So if you do plan on building your own motorcycle from scratch, aside from all the difficult engineering challenges and design challenges that you're going to face above everything else, make sure you sign your name on it and make sure it's the color of your country's flag. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this sort of little piece of interesting history, recent Very history, really, uh, compared to a lot of the things I cover. And I just found this story really inspiring. If you yeah. want to learn more, again, I mentioned this book, Dare to Dream, all about John Britton. And there's also a documentary as well uh, where you guys can learn more details about his life and all the other crazy things he built, like chairs and lamps and glass stuff. Like, he was a real renaissance man. I think that was the best description I read at one point was that he was a renaissance man. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Ride safe. Absolutely. That very very intriguing man that that design on that motorcycle is is absolutely beautiful man i don't know about y'all but you could catch me out on the streets riding that around man i ain't gonna lie even though obviously it's a very rare motorcycle it's a collectible like realistically you wouldn't ride that on the street but you know it's a dope design you know what i'm saying and, and the fact that somebody made this from scratch in their garage just from you know their their own know-how and, and and willpower it's an amazing thing man to see what what the human can do and see what, what can be accomplished is if, if you just stay consistent and you put your mind to it. It's a very, very beautiful thing, man. Man, I, I know all my motorcycle enthusiasts better give this video a thumbs up, man. Because it's a very interesting story about a very interesting man, about a very interesting bike. Post in the comments down below, man. Let me know if this is something that you would have in your garage to look at every day. And of course, smash that big red button. Until next time, y'all, put your muscles up. It's your boy Flex. I'm out of here. Peace.